Daily Tech News Show is made possible by you. Listen in right now. Hi, you. Maybe you're Kelly Cook. You, Kelly Cook, are in fact Kelly Cook. Or Scott Hepburn. Or Jeff Wilkes. Or one of our brand new patrons, Kevin Tommy or Gideon. Everybody welcome in Kevin, Tommy, and Gideon. Feels good to be a new patron, doesn't it? On this episode of DTNS, more info on what caused the CrowdStrike bug and what Microsoft is doing to prevent another one. Synology has an easier way to roll your own cloud. And Apple released Apple Intelligence, but not for everybody. And even developers have to sign up. What's going on there? We'll tell you. This is the Daily Tech News for Monday, July 29th, 2024 in Los Angeles. I'm Tom Merritt. From the Atlanta area, I'm Nika Montford. And I'm the show's producer, Roger Chang. Nika, uh, we are going to talk about the CrowdStrike bug. Uh, you were telling me that uh, you were at a Home Depot when it struck you. Is that right? That is correct. I was doing, I planned on doing a little home DIY project because I had a leak oh, yeah. that did some damage to my oh, guest bathroom, my laundry room, and my kitchen. So I was like, I'm going to go buy some paint. I'm going to paint. Uh, I go to I have my paint chip. I go to get them to scan it. It's like, oh, we can't scan it. I use the app, uh, Bear app to get it. And I was like, here it is. And there was like, oh, we can't mix your paint because <laughs> oh. <laughs> none of our machines were. So I can't scan. And I was like, down. fine, I got it. But I can't mix it because they mix it on site and they don't know the percentages. So I was like, hmm. All right. Thanks, Home Depot. Yeah. You're left with Microsoft Paint as your only option. <laughs> right. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Well, we're going to talk a little bit about what Microsoft wants to do about CrowdStrike bugs of the future so that we don't get any more. But let's start with the quick hits. You know, the Edmonds Guide, it's not the Kelly Blue Book, but it's often confused for the Kelly Blue Book. Uh, it helps you put a value on your car. The website helps you find and buy new and used cars. You can sell your own car. It has a lot of access to people's buying habits. So they have a lot of interesting data to talk about. In the United States, from January to July this year, 32% of people trading in a Tesla got another EV. 25% went for a hybrid, and 43% traded their Tesla in for a traditional combustion engine-powered car. But it's the first time that more than 50% trading in a Tesla didn't go for the gas car. Uh, back in 2019, only 10% of people trading in a Tesla got another EV, and 18% went with a hybrid. So just a few years ago, 71% were going from Tesla to a gas-powered car. Uh, and even within hybrids, a larger percentage are now doing plug-in hybrids as well. Sony released a theme PS5 controller after its Astrobot character in advance of an Astrobot themed game coming September 6th. The Astrobot limited edition DualSense wireless controller has Astrobot's pixelated eyes on the touchpad and a handle and handle accents in Astrobot blue. It's around 80 bucks and it ships September 6th along with the game. That's kind of cute. I like it. Yeah. Yeah. Intel has microcode on the way to fix the crashing 13th and 14th generation models. We talked about that before, but it has become apparent that that is more of a preventative measure. If your processor is crashing, Intel recommends using default settings on your motherboard, but many outlets, including Sean Hollister over at The Verge, pointed out that high voltage from the bug may also permanently damage the processor, and there's no undoing that. Uh, that means your best option in that case would be to replace the processor. Last week, the list of processors affected was limited mostly to the K series, which are more of an enthusiast model. However, it's starting to sound like pretty much any 65 watt and higher CPU, even the non-K variants, are affected by this bug. Asus launched its new ProArt and ZenBook laptops running on AMD's strict point processors. The ProArt P16 ProArt PX13 and ZenBook S16 all use the Ryzen AI HX370. It has a 50 TOPS MPU AI engine and can be certified as a Copilot Plus PC once Windows updates the software for it. The laptops start around or in the range of $1,000 to $2,000. And Fujifilm has developed a Linux software development kit for its GFX 100 line of cameras. 
This is helpful for drone makers who often use Linux variants to operate their drones. Fujifilm says it's actually working directly with Autonomy Holdings, a drone company, to develop a new surveyor for drone that uses the Linux SDK. However, underlying the fact that this is for manufacturers, Fujifilm told Petapixel, the update is for the Japanese market only. Wonk, wonk. You know, it's Linux users, so they're going to figure out a way to get that SDK and use it anyway, no matter where they yeah. are. But but there you go. Uh, and that is a look at the quick hits. All right. Uh, if you caught our episode last week, uh, and if not, go go dig it up. We, we talked about the CrowdStrike preliminary results. So they told us basically how the faulty update got out. Uh, they didn't really tell us details about what in the update was faulty. They do promise to put out full technical details, but Saturday, Microsoft shared some of those details. The problem was with CS Agent. CS Agent is one of four kernel level drivers that Falcon Sensor uh, uses, and it called out of bounds memory. Uh, if you know what that means, you know what that means. And if you don't, uh, you can't do that. That'll cause your program to crash. Uh, the kernel is highly constrained as a security measure. So when out of bounds memory was called, it didn't fail gracefully. It kicked it into recovery mode. Security software runs at the kernel level for a few reasons. The three big ones are it loads before everything else. The kernel is the first thing to load in the operating system. So when you load with the kernel, you have the best chance of catching malware. And it's extremely difficult for malware to get into the kernel. So you can be the first to catch it. Number two. When you have kernel level access, you can block file creation before the file gets created, and you can stop processes like named data pipe transfers, which was specifically what the CS agent was trying to do. And the kernel's tamper resistant, like, like I just said. So it's, it's harder for anything to mess with the security software if it's part of the kernel. CS agent looked at what are called named data pipe transfers. That's a fancy way of saying one of the ways an app can talk directly to another app. So malware does it so they can hide what they're doing and they can try to manipulate other apps to get data out of them. As CrowdStrike learns how malware uses data pipe transfers, it will give frequent updates to CS agent so that CS agent can match patterns and stop those transfers before they can do whatever they're trying to do. Of course, the update on July 19th had that memory error and CrowdStrike's content val validator, as they told us last week, didn't catch the memory error. The content validator is there to catch things like calling out of bounds memory. It failed to do that. So the big failure here wasn't the update so much as it was the, uh, the content validator. Now, Microsoft says that while it understands why these security vendors want to operate at the kernel level, there have been updates to Windows over the years, especially in relation to the, trans, uh, the trusted platform module, that allow you to get a lot of those same advantages that you get running in the kernel without having to run in the kernel. You can run at user mode. Uh, so they are trying to work with security vendors to move as much out of the kernel as possible. That will help because things can fail more gracefully that way. Microsoft is also looking at letting companies use Rust, the programming language, to write any kernel drivers they might still need uh, because Rust is memory proof. So you at least wouldn't have had this particular error, although it might not prevent other errors. No details uh, on when they would let people write in Rust. Uh, but Nika, uh, you know, when you're standing trying to get your paint mixed, I, I don't know if any of this is, is really going to make you feel any better. But, but what, do you, what do you think of the explanation here, is, especially as a developer who kind of probably has to deal with memory errors and stuff like that? So um, I think they've been fairly clear in some of their explanations. Um, but for me... The out of uh, the out of bounds um, error on memory, that's a pretty standard error. And the fact that it, they didn't have any type of um, mechanisms to catch it um, is a little bit concerning because it is well known. We've se all seen it before. When I say we, I'm speaking on the developer side. Yeah, yeah. And so that's one of the things that caught me off guard. One of the other things that we don't really talk about here um, is 
the way that this was rolled out in the first place, I mean, you're doing a huge update like this all at once is it's not smart in in any capacity on any anybody who's done any type of deployment of software knows, you know, pushing it all out at once can be a problem because anything can happen. Um, and it's a 40, it's a 40 kilobyte file. We've done it thousands of times. What could go wrong? Right. And, <laughs> and I, and I talk about this because I started my career, um, yeah. in the QA space as a quality assurance engineer. And one of the things in that space is that QA is the first thing that gets cut, meaning when it comes to budget, meaning when you're on a deadline and you say, and the QA team says, Hey, we need two weeks to fully validate this. Oh no, development was behind, or you know, we're up against this deadline. Can you get it done in a week? And it's not really a question of can you, it's like you have to get it done in a week. So it's those types of things, those types of infrastructure built around your software development process that, you know, there are a couple of points of failure throughout this whole thing that could have caught this type of error. And I know we talked about it on our show as well when it came out. And I said, a lot of companies, um, tools teams, they're in-house software engineers. I know that they are very, they're just as busy as your sysadmins and your IT folks because they are probably now brainstorming, scoping out, trying to create some internal tools mm -hmm. that can help them as a fill safe to say, before we get to this point, let's do a check to see what's going on to make sure because having to reboot manually all of these machines Nobody wants to do that's that. That's no way to live. IT people, it's no way to live. That's it's no way to live. So yeah. I I suspected that there were quite a few, um, you know, meetings from just the tool team tools team perspective of what can we do to help mitigate some of this. So if it does get here, you know, we can act quickly and not be beholden to a vendor or someone else to kind of get us out of this mess. Yeah, yeah, QA QA on the client side uh, instead yeah. of the server side, right? Yeah. Uh, that is definitely something people are going to do more often. I, I get where CrowdStrike is coming from when you're doing these kind of frequent updates of, of essentially definitions. Um, you want to keep them as efficient as possible so you can get them on people's machines and protect them as fast as possible. Mm -hmm. That's why the content validator was there. So I'm now, now we're to that point, right? Of like, okay, mm -hmm. you had a content validator. It's not like you didn't have anything to catch mm -hmm. these kind of memory bugs. Why didn't it? Why didn't the content validator catch the memory bug? Because it does feel like something that content validators should catch. I'm sure CrowdStrike feels the same way. Like, yes, yeah. we thought our content validator should have caught that. So there's yeah. still questions to be asked, uh, to be answered in the full technical evaluation from CrowdStrike. Um, for sure. But for those of us who are just geeky and want to know the explanations, we're getting a little closer. Uh, yeah. But like you say, for those who just don't want their machines to go down in the future, um, CrowdStrike is going to do phased rollouts in the future. Like Nico said, that is essential. And it sounds like Microsoft's trying to do some things as well yep. to just get it out of the kernel. Cause the kernel is yeah. the thing that can catch. Uh, I think it was stoic squirrel was saying the kernel is the thing that catches the problem with the user app. But if it happens in the kernel, the kernel can't catch itself. So Self, right. Yeah. Which come first chicken or the egg. <laughs> yep, yep. Don't put, all of your eggs in one chicken is what we're trying to say. Don't put all of your eggs in one kernel. <laughs> hey, the kernel. Yeah, it all comes back to KFC in the end. All right, uh, let's talk about this Synology network attached storage. It's often proclaimed as one of the best solutions to a backup strategy. If you're somebody who is like, you know what, I don't want to rely on Google and Microsoft for, for cloud storage anymore. Uh, you can roll your own cloud storage with Synology network attached storage, but that's not for everybody. Not everybody wants to do all the admin that's involved with that. So Synology has introduced the B station, B E E B station. They have a couple of other products under the B name, but the B station is this one. It's a four terabyte storage device that has a gigabyte of DDR4 RAM, uh, one Ethernet port, a gigabit Ethernet port, one USB-A port, one USB-C port, and it can work with pretty much everything to auto-sync. 
So like anything else, it's going to take a while to get set up uh, if you're doing four terabytes of backups, but it can work with Apple's Time Machine. It can work with SMB. It can sync to Google Cloud, iCloud, Dropbox, OneDrive. You can plug a USB drive and have it sync. Uh, B Station has its own software that you can use to sync with a computer. Uh, you can also use that software to do a self-hosted web app. So you can just type in an IP address that'll take you to the Synology device and you don't even have to install anything. You can run it off the device itself. It also has some cloud service features so that you can remotely connect to it uh, over the web. And it uses a little bit of machine learning and facial recognition for sorting photos and syncing versions of its files. Uh, Kevin Purdy at Ars Technica said it's not so great at the sorting of the photos, but it is pretty decent at the syncing of the files. Uh, it is not expandable, though. So you buy four terabytes, you got four terabytes. Uh, Synology is basically saying if you need more than that, once you've operated this for a while, maybe you'll want to step up to actual Synology network attached storage, uh, especially if you're paying for Synology's cloud backup. Then you could swap in a Synology NAS pretty easy. Uh, but to get you started, the B station is available right now for $220. Uh, if you don't want to pay for the service, then that's all you'll need to pay. It's not a bad price. Um, I have to say, $220 is not bad at all. Um, what I will say, I think for this type of device, I think it's less intimidating for maybe novice users or non-tech type of people um, because it, it, it gives you a little bit of ease and a little bit of comfort. And a lot of times people are very wary of, you know, using these types of devices because I don't want to lose all of my photos. I have them for 20 years. I don't want to lose them. And it's one of those things where it gives you, it's a little bit of handholding um, you through the process. It gives you a smaller uh, scale of storage, only four terabytes, um, to, you know, get you comfortable and allows you the flexibility to use a multitude of, of sources to, to pull your, your data in. So I think for, um, people who are a little bit intimidated by this, um, it's, it's, it's very helpful. I think it's a good direction for people like me. It's helpful because, I don't want to have to build out my own cloud storage <laughs> if I don't have to. With so, someone, I could buy it for 220 bucks. So bus. for people like me and Nika, if you're too lazy to build out a NAS, this might be a consideration. Uh, right. It's also, like you say, it's a, it's a consideration for somebody who's more like, I miss the Apple time capsule. I just want something mm -hmm. I plug in and it would work. Now, Roger, you have a Synology NAS that you run, yeah. right? Yeah, I, uh, I run like 218... DJ and it, it was one of the budget models, but it, it 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 features a majority of the Synology software, which is what most people are looking for. That means you can do things like transcoding. Uh, it can be a network drive. It can also uh, be your backup. And because it's two bays, really, I just have a mirrored uh, two mirrored twelve terabyte drive, so I have uh, some sort of redundancy. Uh, it is this particular product is very interesting. It. I think people run into the ceiling uh, who who really would be looking at this would probably run to the ceiling pretty quick because four terabytes these days, especially if you're someone who keeps a lot of photos, a lot of personal videos like of the kids, uh, family things, it can, it can get pretty tight quick. Also, there really is no redundancy unless you rely on the cloud backup, which something which the Synology is well known for. Um, I was looking through the interface of, of what they were putting out in the press release and it is pretty simple, but it could still be very in intimidating and confusing for people like my dad who might not be as savvy about cloud storage, uh, where you are either using the B Station interface or you're going through the individual like uh, Google, iCloud, Dropbox, what have you. Um, but I, I do I do think there does need to be a product at what they're aiming at because yeah, NAS. You, setting up a NAS isn't difficult, but it'd be very confusing if you're not familiar with mm -hmm. either networking or uh, a file, file type. Yeah, this is a reasonable product, but the the people that it's meant for keeps getting slimmer the more we talk about it, right? Because yeah. your dad is, to me, the target market of like, yeah, just plug this in and it'll back you up. Should be easy. But if the interface is confusing, they have some work to do there before they can get all of those kinds of users. For somebody like Nika and I who are like, 
we know we should just get a real Synology NAS, but you know we don't want to go through all of that trouble. Uh, it needs to have more than four terabytes. I mean, I yeah, I have yeah. a three terabyte hard drive in my laptop right now, so I I, I need a I need a bigger version. To which Synology is going to say, well, then just buy that two bay NAS that, it, <laughs> that Roger that's has. What I'm it, trying to avoid. I know. And, exactly. and, and I mean, I think that that's kind of the marketing, not the marketing, but kind of the the product kind of corner that they've painted themselves into for what you were describing for my dad time machine actually is probably the best product because it's runs time machine or time capsule no the time machine that oh because he could use time machine with the nas I yeah, see what exactly. or with the and with the b station yeah. exactly and it is something that is transparent like he just does whatever and it backs up in the background he doesn't have to worry about it um Anything that requires anything more than that, I think it straddles an uncomfortable line where people mm -hmm. are going to either go for something maybe not as confusing, but more storage or something that's more capable and importantly, more uh, expandable down the road. And people in our chat room are talking about the fact that it doesn't have Wi-Fi, which makes sense. You don't want to sync over Wi-Fi regularly, but yeah. a, a lot of introductory users are going to want it to have Wi-Fi. They're going to be like, "How do I get an Ethernet out of my modem?" Right? <laughs> they may not. They may not have a router. Uh, so again, I don't think this cracks the entry level NAS market. Yet. I think they do. I think they got to go down another level to but be able yeah. to get the entry level. But they're they're getting there. But I think it's they intriguing. have to do one step down. I think they still need a true entry level. Yeah, yeah. Um, that's and more two, like your traditional plug and play. Two twenty is not bad for this either. No, two hundred twenty bucks. Not at all. Yeah. Uh, well, if you've got your thoughts on this or any other kind of NAS or anything else. Uh, Start the conversation in our Discord. I was just talking to Arcira Chiros about the Apple intelligence upgrade we're about to talk about. Uh, you can be part of that or any conversation by becoming a patron and then linking Discord to your Patreon account. You can do that at patreon.com slash DTNS. Now, we had heard before that Siri wasn't going to get all of its Apple intelligence functions until 2025, though beta testers and developers were probably going to get those functions before the end of the year. Now, Bloomberg's Mark Gurman says none of the new Apple intelligence features will launch with iOS 18 in September. Instead, they're going to come as part of the first update, iOS 18.1, which is expected in October. Uh, that would be non-Siri features, including things like image generation, uh, summaries, integration with chat GPT, etc. The Apple intelligence features are in iOS 18.1. And the reason we know that is because Apple released the developer beta of iOS 18.1 on Monday. So you can get your hands on it right now. Here's the twist. Not only did they release a beta for a point upgrade before the main upgrade was out, usually they would wait until September when iOS 18 came out to release the beta of the point upgrade, but even developers who get the beta of 18.1, and you have to be a developer to get one right now, have to sign up to get Apple Intelligence activated in their beta. Uh, and, and while a lot of people were able to just sign right up, there is a wait list if you don't get on that list right away. So even if you're a developer who gets 18.1, you may not get to try out Apple Intelligence. This is all very unusual. Apple usually doesn't roll out point upgrades until the main one launches. They never have made features that I can recall. I shouldn't say never because maybe there's a couple examples, but they've never made beta features available on a wait list through settings. Um, and this first beta of 18.1 does not include not only some of the Siri stuff, but it does not include image generation, emoji generation, automated photos cleanup, or the chat GPT integration. So you're just getting some text writing assistance and summarization. Uh, German sources say the delay is because they want stability. Uh, they want to do wider scale tests before they roll it out to everyone, which would kind of go with them saying even not all the developers can get Apple intelligence at first. Uh, Nika, you know, as the host of Snob OS, I know you've been covering this story pretty closely. What do you make of this strange rollout? We are in uncharted territory here with Apple, a beta within a beta. That's, that's new. Yeah. Um, it's, 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 it is, it is a little bit shocking because it's like, hmm, what's going on? And the fact, as you mentioned, you know, they're already on 
at 18.1 beta and we haven't even gotten iOS 18 yet. We should get it in what maybe allegedly a month and a half. Um, but I think a lot of this has to do with what the expectation of Apple intelligence was and what their intent was at, at you know, as it relates to what they can actually do. Um, we've talked about it on our show um, with recently both Microsoft and Apple stepping back from their observer roles on the open AI board. Microsoft had been there for a minute. Apple was just getting on. And the following, the following week after we talked about it, you know, they both had stepped back. And I just think it's a lot of issues and unknowns surrounding open AI and chat GPT. And I'm thinking, you know, Apple in particular is being per very careful about the web and the entanglement that they are having with open AI, because in the announcement, they specifically mentioned chat GPT was going to be, you know, the, the first rollout for Apple intelligence. And now with the privacy issues, potential lawsuits uh, coming from open AI, I heard some rumblings about money issues over there as well. Not sure how true that is or not, but it's a lot of question marks around um, using chat GPT. And, you know, as we've seen, we talked about with CrowdStrike, some of the testing that goes along with some of these rollouts, it's all getting a little fuzzy. And, you know, I'm thinking their, their, their thought process is better to be safe than sorry. It's better to not deliver something that could really cause us some headaches um, down the road. Yeah. You, usually these kinds of things, there's more than one reason. And I think you just hit on two very good ones. Uh, wanting to integrate more than just chat GPT is something they admitted at WWDC. They just sort of implied that, you know, well, Google just didn't want to seem to sign on the dotted line. Uh, so maybe they're more motivated to strike a deal there, but also staged rollout to make sure that it doesn't, uh, cause more problems than it solves. Uh, we have had a huge example, like you said, so that makes sense. <laughs> to me too. Um, the other thing that I think they want to do is get developers used to it. And if they're going to have to delay it for some of these other reasons, I can't imagine cash is one of them, but maybe they want to manage how much of the cost is. Uh, they want to roll it out slowly, not only for fighting bugs, but for fighting cost and mm -hmm. to figure out like how a lot of this stuff is done on device, but there is the cloud backup. So they mm -hmm. probably want to get a better idea of how much of a cloud failover are we going to see? How often is that going to happen uh, so that we can cost that out better uh, and give developers a chance to say, here's how you can integrate and use these features in your apps. Uh, which if, again, I, to get back to why are they doing it now, you would normally just call this iOS 18. You would add these. It's normal to not have all the features at, at once, give them to developers early. The only reason you're calling this beta 18.1 is you are planning on not launching these features along with iOS 18 in September. You're trying to buy yourself an extra month. So you want to give developers that runway. Uh, you don't want to hold it till September, but you also don't want to launch it with everything else in September. Right. And the other thing, as you mentioned, cost, uh, Apple intelligence was supposed to be the cornerstone of iPhone 16, right? Of iOS yep. 18. How many phones are they going to sell without their, you know, marquee piece of technology uh, not being available? And the fact that they are doing a beta within a beta within it's, with this developers that all developers aren't going to be able to access this um, initially. So it's, it's a lot of question marks. And like I said before, it is a little bit of an uncharted territory. I don't think um, we've seen this from Apple. I'm sure if we have someone will bring it up, please do. I just can't think of anything in recent memory that... Um, has kind of gone this route. I, I kind of want to say that Apple's not going to have a hard time selling an iPhone even without Apple intelligence in it because <laughs> people know it's coming uh, yeah. and the public beta may be out by then. So maybe you can get it anyway. I hadn't thought of China. So follow me here. 
you, I was like, well, they're probably going to sell iPhones anyway. And then the second thought is, except in China, where they're having a harder time, they are not going to be able to roll out Apple intelligence the same way in China that they are rolling it out in the rest of the world because they won't be able to use chat GPT at all. There are also many more regulations on uh, using AI there, and they have to have a local partner to use cloud AI in China. So that may be another reason to do a delayed upgrade is to say we need more time to get all of our ducks in a row in China so that we have the proper Apple intelligence roll out there as well, because they need people to buy iPhones in China. So many questions. So many questions. All right, let's check out the mailbag. This comes from Bodhi, uh, host of the Kilowatt podcast. He also hosts a great podcast with Rob Dunwood as well. Uh, Bodhi wanted to respond to our thoughts from Thursday's show on Tesla investing money in X's Grok, their AI effort. I want to take a second to comment on a story that Sarah, Rob, and Justin did on Thursday's episode. And it was all about Tesla and possibly investing $5 billion into XAI. What benefit does this give Tesla? Because Tesla already has an AI team that it's currently working on AI efforts to solve full self-driving. And in addition to that, they're using AI to power their Optimus uh, robot, humanoid robot that they're building. But I don't know what specifically Tesla gets in this scenario from XAI. I don't know what the benefit is. I don't know what the, where they would see a $5 billion plus benefit for Tesla. And to further add to my confusion about this, on Tuesday, the 23rd, at Tesla's Q2 2024 earnings call, Elon specifically said that the XAI developers don't want to work on full self-driving efforts. They want to work on advanced general intelligent efforts. And that's the whole reason why he, he started XAI. Yeah, so, so he's basically saying, I, I, I had to keep these AI engineers, but the only way I could keep them was to create a new product because they didn't want to work on the Tesla one. Uh, and Bodhi included that audio for us. Thank, thank you, Bodhi, for sending that along. Uh, we also want to thank Nika Monford for being with us today. Nika, where can people find more of what you're doing? You can find me at Tech Savvy Diva on all of the social sites. Also, you can check out at Snob West Cast on all of the social sites. Um, it's my weekly tech podcast with Brother Tech, where we talk all things Apple and then some. Patrons, stick around for the extended show, Good Day Internet. You may have seen a Wall Street Journal article saying that Amazon is losing interest and losing money on Twitch uh, is Twitch being supplanted by TikTok and Instagram? Nika and I are going to talk about that. Stick around. You can also catch the show live Monday through Friday, 4 p.m. Eastern, 2000 UTC. Find out more at dailytechnewsshow.com slash live. We're back tomorrow talking about what Apple support for RCS means for businesses. Brett Rounceville is pretty excited. He'll tell us why. Come back and see us then. The DTNS family of podcasts. Helping each other understand. Diamond Club hopes you have enjoyed this program. <laughs>